You're listening to Autumn on the Air, the weekly podcast that brings you conversations about the impact of research commercialization and the people who make it happen. Join us for interviews with patent and licensing professionals, innovators, entrepreneurs, and tech transfer leaders on the issues and trends that matter most. Keep listening for an inside track on the people, IP policies, and politics changing our world. Welcome to Autumn on the Air. Recent research has highlighted that patents by majority female inventor teams receive significantly fewer citations, up to 22% less than those by majority male teams. Citations play a key role in measuring the impact and value of patents. So this gap has important implications, not only for inventors themselves, but for the overall innovation landscape. Why are patents by female inventors cited less frequently? And how does this affect their future development and broader innovation potential? Our guest today is Gary Subramani, Assistant Professor in the Department of Management at Lehigh University. Gary's research focuses on gender and resource inequality and innovation using data-driven approaches to uncover disparities and explore interventions. Before entering academia, Gowry worked as a consultant and as a political appointee in the U.S. Department of Treasury's Office of Economic Policy during the Obama administration. Her work spans the U.S. patent system and digital platforms, where she examines the implications of representation on innovation and entrepreneurship. Welcome, Gowry. Thanks so much for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and talk about this work. Yes, we're really excited to have you here. And this is such important work and your paper is really fascinating. And I thought that was probably be the best place for us to start. So if you wouldn't mind, if you could give us an overview of your recent working paper and also tell us a little bit about what motivated you to explore gender disparities in patent citations. Yeah, my co-author, Michelle Saxena, who's an economist at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and I started working on this project almost by accident. Michelle and I were exploring another idea about the dimensions on which patents by female inventors differ from patents with male inventors. So we looked at a bunch of different measures, and we saw that on many dimensions, female inventors' patents performed higher by our metrics. They had higher stock value as measured by this Kogan measure. Um, They had more new words, but not when it came to citations. So we were interested then in understanding what was going on with citations and decided to zoom in there. So patent citations are an established way by which researchers really measure the impact and by extension, the quality of an invention. And it's also a way to map the flow of technologies over time. So what we see in this work is that in the aggregate, female inventors' patents receive fewer citations than patents by male inventors. And what we really try to do in the paper is to decompose this gap by understanding how much of it can be explained by observable characteristics of patents or inventors. And even once we control for all observable variables, we see a gap of almost 4% in the number of citations received by female inventors' patents. Speaking of citations, the paper highlights that the majority of female inventor teams receive up to 22% fewer citations than majority male teams. Why do you think this citation gap exists? This is really the the goal of the paper, right, is to break down that gap. So we start, so this 22% is the aggregate gap that we find. If we just compare the corpus of female inventors' patents to the corpus of male inventors' patents, and we see that when we control for technology and year of patent, the gap shrinks to 15%. So some of this gap is driven by female inventors' patents being newer because female inventors make up a higher proportion of more recent inventors. Um, and some of it is because female inventors and male inventors patent in different types of technologies that have different citation patterns. Then we control after that for uh, patent and inventor characteristics of so things like inventor location and firm assignee. And the gap shrinks from 15% to 13%. And next, we have controls for a specific firm. And this is where it starts to get quite granular. So we're comparing patents from female inventors and male inventors who work at the same firm. And then the gap goes down to 7%. Then finally, we add in team size controls, and the gap goes down to 4%. 
And that's the part of the gap that we're not able to explain. The rest of it, we can attribute to all of these characteristics. So we see that 4% is really the gendered component of the gap. And to unpack that, then we look at, and I think we'll talk about this uh, later as well, the source of the citation. So whether it comes from examiners or applicants. And when we say applicants, that can include inventors, their attorneys, or anyone who works on the application from the applicant side. And we see that the gap is disproportionately driven by applicant added citations as opposed to examiner added citations. So what we identify here is that this gap exists because first, female inventors' patents are less likely to be cited by other relevant patents. And second, female inventors' patents appear to be less likely to be further developed by subsequent inventions. Now, one of the things the paper mentions, and you've mentioned this a little bit, is that patent citations are a key metric for evaluating innovation. So how do you think this gender gap in citation impacts the perceived value of patents from majority female teams? It's really important right, to understand if there are dynamics here because patent citations are the dominant way by which patent impact has been historically measured. There are alternative ways of measuring patent impact. Uh, for example, looking at the stock market responsiveness to patents, looking at patent text. But citations have and continue to be a really useful measure because they're available for all patents, not just those from publicly traded firms, for example. And they're a dynamic measure. So they evolve over time and we can see sort of the legacy of a patent and how it evolves. And citations are also useful because they give us a sense of how often the information within an invention is leveraged by subsequent inventors. So given this, the way we think about it is that a gender gap in citation could indicate a few things. It could mean first that female inventors patents are less likely to be cited by subsequent inventions because they're less likely to be built upon. There are not inventions that are doing things that are related. The second is that female inventors' patents are less likely to be cited even when they might be relevant. And this is possible because based on conversations that we had with individuals in the patent office, we really started by trying to understand what is the process by which citations get added to patents. Uh, we learned that not every relevant patent needs to be included in a list of citations. So for example, if two patents might be cited for the same purpose, only one has to be included. So if the second uh, explanation that female inventors' patents are less likely to be cited, even when they may be relevant, is true, then female inventors' patents could be perceived as less impactful than they actually are. And another reason I think it's really important to uh, isolate these two different drivers is that I think we have a tendency when we see that there's a gap, especially a gender gap, to immediately attribute that to bias, right? To say that female mentor patents aren't getting cited because there's bias. And I'm, I study gender gaps in a variety of settings. I'm, I'm certainly never going to deny that bias exists in a lot of these contexts. But I think that that washes away a lot of the important nuance when it could be, it is, I think, important to understand if the lack of citation actually reflects a lack of development of these ideas. Now, I want to go back to something you alluded to a little bit before and that you found that the gap is primarily driven by applicant added citations rather than examiner added citations. What's the significance of that finding? Yeah, this is, I think, one of the coolest findings from the paper. Um, citations are primarily added to patents by applicants or examiners. And I'll say again, when we refer to applicant citations, we don't mean citations added by inventors. Applicant citations include citations from various applicant-affiliated people. So it could be the inventor, it could be the attorney, it could be the patent agent. So the process of patent review really involves a back-and-forth exchange between the applicant and the examiner. And during this process, often citations are added to an application. Still, one, one caveat I want to add is that the majority of citations are added by applicants and not by examiners. There is some research that came out um, more than 10 years ago that found that examiners add the majority of citations. And that was actually due to an error in the way that the data was kind of coded. So the majority of citations, so this is kind of a, a common misperception a lot of researchers still have because it was a very uh, highly cited paper. But the majority of citations are added by applicants. But prior research has actually found that examiner added citations are both more relevant and a better indicator of patent quality than applicants added citations. 
So when we break out uh, citations by applicant added and examiner added citations and look at this gender gap separately for those two sets of citations, we see that the gender gap is driven entirely by applicant added citations. Wow. And there's no gender gap in examiner added citations. So given this, we interpret these results as indicating that this aggregate gender gap in citations that is introduced by applicants is not necessarily an indicator of some underlying difficult to observe quality differences between majority male and majority female inventor patents, but it's rather a result of other dynamics that drive applicant citations. Very, very interesting. And, you know, I think another really interesting aspect of your research was that majority male teams are more likely to cite patents from other majority male teams. So how does this tendency where people tend to interact more often with those who are similar to them contribute to the overall disparity in citations? This is something that we were excited to see. And it also, it's a little... uh, Disheartening. I was going to say disturbing and disheartening are the right words. So we identified that gender homophily or this gender in-group preference appears to be a factor in patent citations. And we know from a lot of previous work that female inventors are underrepresented relative to their population share. Female inventors make up less than 20% of USC2 applicants today. Historically, it's even less. So because there are more male inventors than female inventors, preferences for citing inventors of the same gender will disproportionately increase citations to patents with majority male inventors. So you already have a group that's underrepresented. And then if there's this in-group preference, uh, the citation gap can really explode as a result of that. Now, I think another interesting finding that the study suggests was that patents by majority female teams are less likely to be further developed So how do you think this underdevelopment affects the broader innovation landscape, especially in sectors where women are leading inventors? So this really speaks to the other potential explanation for the gender gap in citations received, which is that it might be that female inventors' patents don't get cited because there just isn't as much follow-on work that could cite them. So what I've talked about thus far is really trying to compare similar patents and see if there are differences in how frequently they get cited. Now we're thinking about if we just look at female and male inventors' patents, is it that there's a difference in, in work that comes afterwards? So this is, of course, really hard to evaluate because how do you see or measure missing innovations, right? Innovations that don't exist. So we conduct this analysis at the technology level and we examine how citations to all of the patents in a given technology group change as the gender composition of the technology area changes. And we find evidence that citations to patents in a CPC group, in a technology group, are negatively correlated to the presence of female inventors in that technology. So we do the analysis this way because there might be some underlying potential within technologies, right? There might be a type of technology that's more or less commercializable or has more potential for further study. So we look within technologies how citations to that technology change as the gender composition of inventors evolve. Then the next thing we do is we we leverage a novel measure of tech similarity to see how similar female inventors' patents are to inventions that both precede and follow them. And we see that while majority female inventor patents are more distinct from the patents that they come after, subsequent patents are less similar to them than they are to patents with male inventorship. So together, these results indicate two things to us. The first is that technology areas with more female inventors grow more slowly, even holding the technology fixed. And the second is that female inventors' patents are more distinct from prior patents, and in that sense, more potentially radical. So I'll give you an example of what is very distinct. So we see new words appear. And uh, a new word would have been, for example, BRCA, right? That was to discover that was you know, a novel finding. So things that are patents that are more distinct from prior work as far as the words that they use are considered to be potentially more radical, more disruptive. So female inventors' patents are more distinct, but subsequent patents don't follow in their footsteps. So we can't identify the specific reasons for this, but 
our findings are consistent with a lack of attention to female mentors' findings. Yeah, that is a little bit disturbing when you think about it, the lack of attention to to female inventor findings. And I'm curious about the role of social networks in this dynamic. How does gender affect access to networks that facilitate knowledge diffusion in the patent system? We were interested in if the gap could be explained by female inventors being less embedded in in venture networks, and this in turn reducing the likelihood that they're cited. We actually were almost hoping in a sense that we would see this aggregate gap and then kind of explain it away. And we would then be able to understand, you know, that doesn't mean that there's no bias or that there aren't issues to solve, but we could see these are sort of the the things to target. Um, So we looked at the role of inventor networks by constructing measures of co-inventor relationships and evaluating if inventors were more likely to be cited by their previous co-authors. And interestingly, we found that including this as a control didn't change our results. We see that while female inventors have smaller networks and network ties increase the likelihood of citation, you're more likely to cite a friend of yours than you are to cite someone else. Uh, This doesn't account for the gap that we find. So it doesn't make the gap go away. So I'm curious, Gary, how do you think this disparity in citations could influence future patenting trends for female inventors and their likelihood of contributing to long-term innovation? So to some extent, this depends on how sensitive inventors or people who fund innovation are to the credit that their patents receive or the impact of their patents as measured by citations. But our concern is partly that this gap Citations can translate to other gaps and returns to invention for female inventors. So this is outside of the scope of the paper per se, but if female inventors see fewer employment or wage gains from their inventions, this certainly affects their incentives to participate in invention. And by the metric that researchers have used, citations, women are getting undercredited for their work. So this is actually an area Michelle and I are exploring in ongoing research, looking at you know, who gets rewarded from participation in invention in other ways other than just citation. Yeah, and that's disturbing, right? Because women tend to have a lot of other commitments outside of their job. And if there isn't that incentive there to, you know, you know, invent, you know, given all the other pulls that they have on their time and engagements that they have, it's less likely they're going to want to engage in the patent system. Right. There's a burgeoning body of literature around this, but some of the nudges that can encourage participation in patenting are really quite uh, small. It's amazing how these things can affect who decides to invest their time. Absolutely. So let's take a step back and look at the broader picture. How do you think this undercitation of women's patents impact industries that heavily rely on cumulative innovation, such as healthcare or technology? Our findings suggest that there's less innovation that builds on female inventors' patents. And in that sense, their work might die on the vine. This is a phrase that's used in economics. It could not reach its potential in future applications. And this is really problematic, I think, especially for fields like healthcare and technology, because a growing body of research shows a few things about these fields. These are male-dominated fields. Women can have disproportionately poor outcomes in these settings. And women's inventions in these areas might better address the female population's needs. So if you're less likely to build on inventions by female inventors, I think it just exacerbates all of these underlying problems. Absolutely. And do you think there are any parallels between the gender gap in patent citations and the broader gender gap seen in academic research citations? And how do you think these systems are similar or different? I'm really glad you asked this because I'm glad to have the opportunity to clarify this. We were partly inspired by the existing work on gender gaps in academic patenting. And there's a robust body of literature that looks at gender differences in citations. Some of the work is mixed, but many papers find that academic articles written by male authors are more likely to be cited than those written by female authors. But an important distinction between our setting and the academic setting is that patent citations differ in what they convey. 
So in an academic setting, a higher citation count having a really long list of references in a journal article is typically viewed as an indicator of research quality. You've done your homework. And we as researchers extend this assumption to patent citations. But while academic papers really comprehensively cite uh, prior research, the burden for patent citations is lower in this respect. And patent citations can be influenced by other non-content-based reasons. So applicants are actually often apprehensive of including citations that might limit the scope of what they can claim patent rights to. So to some extent, there's a desire to actually cite as little as possible, sort of your minimal set of citations that you need. And patents uh, need not include all relevant citations to demarcate the scope of patentable knowledge in the application. And there's this strategic citation behavior that can leverage to minimize litigation risk as opposed to comprehensively citing all relevant prior art. So as a result, patents usually don't require as many citations as an academic paper might. So one citation can do the job while an academic paper might have four citations about a specific finding. So you have to have a citation that talks about that thing. You don't have to have all of the citations that could be used. So in this sense, patent citations actually give us an interesting opportunity to see whose citations are being chosen. Very, very interesting. And, you know, I think that leads me to ask you, you know, universities and tech transfer offices are always looking for ways to try and get more female inventors and innovators involved. What do you think that they can do to help address gender disparities in patent citations? And are you aware of any initiatives that you've seen that have been working on this? This is a great question. So given what we've found about applicant added citations being the driving force behind the gender gap in citations, I think the onus is actually on applicants and tech transfer offices to proactively think about the processes by which they search for and add citations. Is it just the default to add citations uh, that have previously been included on on successful applications on a similar topic? This is something the examiners we spoke to said they often see that firms will just reuse the citations from a previous patent. I have to admit, as a patent attorney, I'm guilty of that. Yes. Right. So it's uh, good to hear in that it validates sort of our prior. (laughs) Yes. That's that's also what we've seen. So then thinking about whose citations are those? Right, whose citations are being included and thus whose citations are, are being left off. I actually haven't seen any initiatives on this, but we would certainly be interested in learning about them and potentially evaluating their impact if they exist. You can imagine if there were some kind of more rigorous process implemented in some universities or some institutions around looking at the lists of citations, you might actually see that those lists end up looking a little bit different. Maybe they end up including more women after you you know, review actually the same list of citations you've been adding to everything for the past few years. And I'd like to encourage our listeners, if any of you are working on this particular issue, please reach out to Gowrie. I think she would really, really like to talk to you. Yes, definitely. This is something that we're we're lucky to be able to use the rich administrative data from USPTO. But what's really amazing in the patent context is if you're ever able to have something that's sort of an experimental intervention for which you can actually look at the impacts of a policy change um, and hopefully show what we as people who participate in this ecosystem can do to move the needle. Absolutely. So that leads me to want to ask you how your research contributes to the larger conversation about diversity and inclusion in innovation, particularly when it comes to patenting and intellectual property. Definitely. So both Michelle and I are really interested in understanding the dynamics of representation in the patent system and what the antecedents and the implications of this are. And this is also an institutional priority at USPTO. So there's this Council for Inclusive Innovation. It's really a tangible signal of the organization's commitment to increasing diversity in patenting. So what we hope to show in this work is Another dimension, aside from just representation in terms of who applies for and who receives patents, in which there's a gender gap that might impact our understanding of the value of inventors' work. And we're also bringing some attention to post-grant outcomes, which are otherwise often tough to study. 
if researchers use patent citations as a measure of patent impact and quality, and we see that there are these reasons that we can't really explain that female inventors are receiving fewer citations, this can actually introduce bias into how we think of the value of female versus male inventors' contributions to the system at large. Very, very interesting. And yeah, it's going to be... Uh fascinating to see where you go from here. And and actually, that is a great segue to my last question for you, which is what's next for your research in this area? And are there other dimensions of innovation inequality that you plan on exploring? Absolutely. We're currently working on some new projects that are looking at the role of attorneys in the patent system, as well as trying to understand if there are differential returns to patenting by inventor demographics. And one thing I'll mention in case any real listeners have data that they're interested in sharing is that we'd really love to get into some of the well, the less well studied dimensions of demographics and examine things like racial or socioeconomic gaps in patenting as well. But the real limitation there is data availability. It's uh, easier to infer gender from name than it is to infer any of these other things from name. So uh, we are looking into merging some other data sets that will allow us to get closer to that. And hopefully we'll have some interesting updates for you in, in the next year. Thank you so much, Gary, for sharing all your insights on this extremely critical issue with us. This has been really great having you on the podcast. We look forward to seeing how your research continues to shape the conversation around gender and innovation. And as you continue to publish more of your work, we would really like to have you back on the podcast. Thank you so much. To our listeners, thank you for tuning in to Autumn on the Air. Stay connected with us for more episodes exploring all things tech transfer. Thanks for listening to Autumn on the Air with Lisa Mueller. Get social with us and share your thoughts. You can tweet us at AUTM or visit us online at AUTM.net. We'll be back next week on the air. Be sure to join us. 